Okay, welcome back to the uh, Diverse Ed Sessions this morning. We have our second panel on the topic of diverse curriculum. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel for this morning. We have Amadi Panasar, who is a head teacher. We also have with us Chris Richards, the, uh, an international teacher of English as a foreign language and a mentor. Lila El Maturi, who is an education consultant and Stonewall champion and Sufyan Sadiq, who hasn't quite joined us yet, but will, uh, who is the director of the teaching school. And our partner speaker for today is Penny Rabiger from Lifter. So we're talking about diverse curriculum. I'm gonna hand over to Amardeep pretty much straight away um, to talk us through your thoughts. Amardeep, can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, good morning, everyone. Take two, here we go. It must be the nervousness kicking in and the excitement at the same time. So I'm Amadeep Panas, a head teacher of a primary school in Islington, a very diverse community. And what I would like to do is talk to you about cultural competency and how important it is for us, which we know, to be aware culturally for our children that we teach. I will use the term our children, I don't mean my children, our children that we teach in our schools. So let, let's start off with why we need to address uh, these concerns and these issues. So first of all, African and Caribbean children and people face more ingrained pathways into the criminal justice system, more so than other communities. Okay, over the last five years, statistics show that young ethnic minority people in the UK are, uh, sorry, are more likely to be unemployed compared to their white ethnic people, sorry, I'm just, my friends falling, sorry, sorry guys, <laughs> about white counterparts. In 2014, the probability of black African women being detained under the Mental Health Legislation Act in England was seven times greater than for white British women. So we know there are concerns, we know there are issues. So, you know, these, these injustices for our young people it's what do we do how do we change our own perceptions um, so in terms of us being aware I'd like to talk about our own self perceptions and those of others so let's just take a moment for ourselves our attitudes and beliefs towards others from different ethnic minority communities even within our own cultures and our own races we have uh, a range of beliefs and perceptions attitudes and beliefs towards different minorities and also towards the dominant group. So I'd like to now talk about my own experiences as an ethnic minority leader and someone who's been born and bred in East London and the barriers that we faced. And actually it's only now that things begin to make sense as you get older and wiser and you see what is going on out there in the real world. So I grew up uh, born and bred in Forest Gate in East London. Uh, our family is originally Sikh and we are Indian. Um, however, our family were born in Kenya. So my whole childhood, I, I went around saying that I was from Africa. Uh, and the only time I realized that actually, oh, you're not African is when I went to Camp America and I was 18 years old and all the international staff were having a conversation. And there was a young lady from Tanzania and we were speaking in Swahili. And she then asked me what tribe I was from. That's when I froze because I actually wasn't from a tribe and I thought, oh, something is confusing here. Uh, and then I went back and had the conversation with my parents. So to my parents, our culture was very much, this is what you are. You are from Kenya. You know, we had masks all over the house and not COVID masks, obviously, the ethnic minority uh, tribal masks and so on. Um, so it was very an interesting experience for me. Um, I went to secondary school in Newham and again, there was a lack of diversity. There were mainly ethnic minority children in our school and the shock for me came actually when I went to university to study sports science, which was culturally unusual. Um, and I remember I went to Brunel University, a theatre full of 300 students and there were eight of us from ethnic minorities and that's when I felt it going into that lecture theatre. And actually our children do experience this even now. Um, you know, I've learned in terms of where I work in, in London, our school is in King's Cross. It's an amazing diverse school. And for me, most of my cultural experiences and learning experiences have actually come from the school. Uh, we've had colleagues from all over. We've got very diverse staff. And actually I 
I see that racism obviously works both ways, not just for, towards children and other colleagues, but also when a white colleague is trying to educate a black child and a black parent, the defensiveness and actually the black parent has straight away turned around and come to me and said, actually, you, you, you don't know, you don't understand because you come from a privileged background. And then I, that was a very difficult conversation for me to have with this ethnic minority parent and actually said, this member of staff has chosen to work in an inner city school. They do understand children. They do understand. Um, so let's work collectively to that with each other on that. So there's a lot in terms of internalized racism. I mean, even within our own communities, I remember growing up as a child and, you know, members of the family saying, don't, don't play out in the sun. You're going to get darker. And are we aware that these are the barriers our children go, go, grow up with? I, you know, I often sit with the children at lunchtime. It's my favorite time of a school day. And actually that's where you have your most powerful conversations. And I've had, you know, a black Somali girl say to me, I'm not beautiful because I'm so dark. She's in year one, she's five years old, and they, those perceptions still exist because of what's coming either from home or around them. You know, I had a black Somali boy, he's got Afro-Caribbean hair, and actually turned around and said, I want soft hair. And I thought, these cultural messages are not coming from home. So it's so important as a school, we address them and we help and support our children. And it comes with our education as well. And what I'm learning is that even with staff, staff from mixed heritage uh, cultures, staff from all different cultures, do they know? So one of the things we did as a school um, during our inset day was to have that cultural competency talk and actually people understanding where we all come from. And are we fully aware? Like I said, I, I thought I was African until I was about 18 years old. So it's, it's what conversations have taken place at home you know, it's so important to be culturally inclusive for these reasons. And, you know, there's a video we, I'm sure you've all seen with uh, that Michelle Obama got involved in where the little girl is having her hair plaited, the little black girl, and she sees Michelle, Ob um, not Michelle Obama, her hair's being plaited. She looks at herself in the mirror and she cries and says, I'm ugly. And it really does touch you in so many ways. And you think, how do we then support these children all the time? And say, actually, no, you are beautiful. Um, because those children do get left out. We see it in schools, you know, we are all hardwired to like people like us, similar mindsets, similar cultures. But that's where we need to shift and it is incredibly difficult, particularly with the communities that we work with. We can only empower our children and they can take that message back to their parents. Um, my final closing message is, you know, the world assumes that young people of color will fail we have to do the opposite. We have to be the power collectively, regardless of color and ethnic minority in order to drive this message forward. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, I think it is their diversity first. Um, that um, we have someone broadcasting from the gym. So we do have a, a bit of background noise um, that your message came across loud and clear. And I absolutely agree. Uh, cultural competency is a term that we should be really thinking about. So thank you for sharing that with us. So moving swiftly on, we have Christopher Richards, who's going to be talking to us about diversity in textbooks. Christopher, over to you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I'm Chris. I'm currently based in, in Madrid. Um, I trained in the UK um, 10 years ago as a high school teacher. And I have a very vivid memory of somebody telling me about the importance of images in the classroom when I was doing my PGC back then. Um, and interestingly enough, I thought that linked really well to what um, Amrdeep was just saying about cultural messages and where, where students get things from. Um, so 10 years ago, teaching English in England, um, we made very little use of textbooks. Uh, in English departments. Um, it was challenging, <laughs> as I'm sure we're all aware, but if we focus on the positive aspect of that, that gave me a lot of freedom to use my own images, my own ideas, be creative in the classroom. It does mean you have to be quite careful with your internet searching. I actually did yesterday preparing for this, um, just a quick uh, internet search on the term reading, um, and the first images uh, that came up, uh, mostly kids, mostly white. The first four images were girls. Um, the first negative image we see was a bored boy holding a book. And then when I searched for man reading, in the first 32 images, we find a person of color twice. And the first one appeared 12th. Um, and just, just another, another kind of element, um, gray hair appeared three times. So 
we want to we have to look very carefully when we want to bring our own um, images and our own ideas. We can't just Google search and, and replace. We have to be quite careful. Uh, for well, five years ago, I moved into to ELT, uh, English language teaching, and uh, four years ago, I moved across to to Spain. Um, and things were very very different. Every group uh, had an assigned course book. Um, they all came in that particular institution. They all came from three major UK publishers. Um, we had to follow them. We could substitute, we could supplement, but we were following these, these books. And I started to notice very quickly the representation was extremely narrow. Um, and then as I was studying my, my Master's of Education, I was studying Applied Linguistics, I decided to write my dissertation on gender and sexuality representation in ELT course books. And it all began, that inspiration began with a page in a, in a course book we were using with adults um, of a B1 level, so they, 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 they can communicate reasonably well, um, on a page about different weddings in the UK. And of course, the four couples represented were all straight and they were all white. So I was not really sure quite how they were different, apart from the fact that one was in a church and the other three were not. Um, so to cut 20,000 words short, uh, gender was presented uh, traditionally, uh, well, largely traditionally, there were some images of women in power, um, although men always had power in the pictures that we saw, um, and minority sexuality wasn't there at all. Um, so I've then been thinking and talking uh, with people about how we can we can move this this forward in, in, in our industry, and I was hoping to share some ideas with you guys about what we can do in terms of mainstream teaching as well. And I think if we're working with textbooks, or even if we're not, we need to be always ready to substitute and supplement, especially images, so that we're not always showing the same um, color palettes, we're not always showing the same kinds of people uh, in, in our classrooms, but also the text themselves, um, because if our kids always read the same stories, they're always going to get the same cultural messages, uh, as we've already discussed. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves whose stories are getting told, and who is effectively therefore being silenced, um, because it isn't that we're only showing one thing, we're actually making something else not have room or we're taking away the room. Uh, so it's about inclusion, it's effort, it's a habit. We have to get into the practice of asking these questions. Um, I also ask students what's missing from pages. So sometimes I'll just deliberately present them with something that's not particularly representative and ask them what's not there. Um, but also what, unwant um, what unwanted associations can be brought with inclusion. Um, often we see in our materials in ELT, this, uh, people with disabilities, uh, routinely referred to in heroic situations, as in overcoming something rather than just being a person that's achieved something. Um, women in positions of power, great, but are we showing men who are in homemaking roles um, that that's a valid choice and a valid lifestyle um, pathway as well? Um, are queer folk only shown when their queerness is the defining factor? Uh, I have a colleague who always uses an image of Neil Patrick Harris, his husband and their twins, when teaching the vocabulary item twins. Nothing to do with their relationship, but they're just there in the background. So my final thought is just that we always have to ask the question of ourselves that who is getting a voice and who is getting seen in our classrooms. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was really powerful. And I, I completely understand what you mean about that representation in textbooks. It's something that uh, we really need to think about. Um, so with that in mind, let's move on to Lila El Metui, who is our um, representation, uh, who's our represented uh, education consultant, uh, who has been working with Stonewall. She's a Stonewall champion. And you're going to talk to us about an inclusive and bias free curriculum, Lila. Over to yeah, I don't work with Stonewall. I'm the Stonewall Lesbian Role Model of the Year and and I'm founder of Pride in Education and Educating at Racism. Thank you, Benny. Thank you, Hannah, and all of the diverse uh, team and partners. And welcome uh, to everyone who's joined us today. My talk is about having a trauma-informed, bias-aware and compassionate curriculum. So what does that mean? Amanda mentioned refugees and trauma in the previous panel, and my curriculum background is in ESOL, English to Speakers of Other Languages, EFL, Teaching English to Migrants, Refugees, and People Seeking Refuge, which is a much better term than asylum seekers. And I will be talking about it from a further education perspective in the UK, and also looking at the language that we use. So trauma-informed, we can look at it from many different angles, but I'd like to suggest a couple. One, personal trauma. You cannot look at someone and guess what their background and experiences have been. Two, historical trauma, which includes decolonizing the curriculum and not looking at subjects in silos. For example, teaching French. One could look at where it is spoken, 29 countries. Why? 
because France was colonized um, those country. The language we use is important. These countries were not conquered, as stated in Britannica.com, but invaded. And from an ESOL perspective, it means being mindful of potential triggers and having systems in place to support them. But also, the trauma that people may have is experienced as a result of leaving their home or the current pandemic. Two, bias aware. It's about breaking down stereotypes and being aware of your own prejudices. That's a really good way to start. Looking at LGBT lies, for example, some of the myths commonly heard within the ESOL sector includes, you cannot embed LGBT plus within classes where people have low level of English. Looking at the language we use and teach, asking about pronouns, referring to partner and siblings, rather than husband, wife, sister, brother, will lead to a more inclusive curriculum. Lisa mentioned stories in the previous panel, and Chris just now talked about the lack of visibilities in course books. For those very reasons, I have designed my very own resources, and one can embed any themes within a story. I have written narratives which included themes such as domestic violence, social isolation, my journey to the UK. By cre creating relatable and meaningful content, we will develop more than reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills, but skills like empathy, critical thinking, and compassion, which leads me on to the compassionate Greek element. Compassion is about kindness and fostering an environment where people are free to make mistakes, experiment, and express their authentic selves. Challenging discrimination compa compassionately is about eliciting the difference between understanding, agree, and accept, eliciting the difference between an insult and an opinion. This needs to be contextualized within a whole organizational approach and include, as mentioned earlier, the use and collection of data so that the content reflects local population, understanding achievement, success and progression, zero tolerance policy with regards to discrimination, easy access to resources, knowledge sharing and training, making different groups visible and represented 365 days a week, not just for Black History Month or LGBT History Month Disability Week. Organizations need to have supporting forums to raise issues, clear and visible commitment from senior leadership, but we also need, and that's my last point, ESOL funding. It has been slashed by the UK government, more than half, in fact, in the last five years, with the imminent exit from the EU in the UK, immigration law, Windrush, I mean, the list is massive. Digital exclusion has been um, highlighted by this pandemic, with the most vulnerable groups not being able to access ESOL provision due to not having a mobile phone or access to the internet. So we also need to give people the tools to access learning um, is also part of having a compassionate curriculum. To end on a positive, I want to highlight how kind people have been and I'd like to invite any ESOL practitioners watching to join the newly created Facebook group called Digital Pedagogy for ESOL um, Teachers, where practitioners can get practical tools and resources to share knowledge and support each other. I started it yesterday, we've got a, a close to uh, 120 people join in and people have saying this is how you use it when learners have a mobile phone this platform is really good and i think together we can and we will ride this shit show thank you <laughs> no, inimitable as always lila thank you so much um so just for any of our sensitive viewers i apologize for any square swearing this is very channel four right now um but so many important points made lila and you're right the barriers are there um language digital technology um and and so thank you for sharing that and i know that we have sufyan i know sufyan we've had a few connection issues so hopefully we will have you for the duration um sufyan you're here to talk about an inclusive curriculum uh, I will hand straight over to you excellent thank you very much I hope everyone can hear me uh, it's really a, a, when I was thinking about inclusive curriculum the thing that really resonated with me uh, was the aspect of understanding inclusive curriculum in a macro perspective which is actually looking at all of the diversity all of the protected characteristics not just uh, uh, one or two characteristics and that's probably um, at a macro level at a top level when you're looking at your curriculum in a school when you're looking at your curriculum in your subject area are you aware and conscious of all of the different protected characteristics but then it's also about honing in and looking at that micro level 
uh, of protective characteristics, the ones that affect you in your class. So if within your context, if within your locality, that the challenge is, is, uh, is around ethnic minorities. If you have, in, like in one of our schools, 98% uh, of the kids are from a Pakistani background, then you have a particular characteristic that might be race and religion, uh, ethnicity, but it might be other factors as well. But it's about understanding where you are in terms of inclusivity. What are you looking at? It's really important to start with that point first. What do you want to achieve in an inclusive curriculum? For me, an inclusive curriculum is about making sure that everyone in that class, as the name says, feels included. Everyone feels that what they, the, their background, where they come from, things that are particular to them are things that they uh, can feel that can come out within a lesson. Uh, looking at a history lesson recently, looking at a geography lesson recently within uh, our school, looking at the fact that we were looking at the geography of uh, the Himalayas, the foothills of the uh, mountain near Kashmir, uh, will engage some of the young people in my context a lot more than if they were looking at the Alps. Uh, it's a small change, it's a, a small thing to do, but it brings about a level of connection that doesn't otherwise uh, e exist in the lessons. Looking at, we, we talked about, Leila talked about colonizing. Uh, we originally resonate a lot of the, myself and the young people within our context. We come from uh, India, Pakistan region, and therefore the colonization aspect is a part of our history that we can't really undo. But again, the fact that it wasn't a part of our history in, in the curriculum that's taught in school was quite shocking. And actually, now that we are able to look at that, and talk about that, the, the level of engagement is huge in lessons. I think the key challenge, and this is probably speaking more as a leader than a practitioner in the class, is the question that you need to ask yourself as leaders is teaching inclusivity, is it a nice thing to do? And I, I don't, I'm very business orientated in my approach. I don't think anything should be done because it's a nice thing. Uh, it should be done because it adds value. And what does value look like? If you are developing a more inclusive curriculum, will that lead to improvements in results and outcomes? Yes, it will. Will it lead to better engagement of learners? Yes, it will. Will it mean that some of you learners that were perhaps a bit disenchanted, disconnected, are they more engaged? Yes, they are. So that's really important and an important part of how inclusivity is looked at from a perspective of the curriculum. And probably I think the, the last point that I would look at is when I'm thinking about an inclusive curriculum, it should be at a top level in a school. It's great to see teachers that are making changes uh, within a subject area, but an inclusive curriculum can come in all shapes and all forms. It can't be forced in some subject areas, and I do think it's about naturally occurring opportunities. I do think sometimes when people are sitting in maths and saying, right, maths, what do we do? How do we bring black people into maths? Uh, now, having a few role models uh, on the walls, that's fine, but I don't think you need to get to a situation where you're forcing yourself uh, for the sake of ticking a box and everyone on this scheme of work has to tick a box to say, we've looked at inclusivity in our scheme of work. That doesn't instill and create a culture, an ethos, a philosophy in a school. That becomes what, as teachers, we all do is think, oh no, yet another, I've got to include English and maths, I've got to include inclusivity, I've got to include safeguarding or something. For, for me, it's about creating a culture where we look at our uh, curriculum in a creative way that will allow inclusivity to add value to the curriculum, add engagement to the curriculum, and bring about better outcomes for our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Sufyan. I absolutely agree. I echo so many of your points. Um, and lots of people worry about the box ticking aspect of uh, diversity. So it's good that you've addressed that. Um, and perhaps we can bring that up a bit later. Last but not least, we have the ubiquitous Penny Rabiger, who's got a fantastic haircut. I'm last long time since I've seen you, Penny. Uh, you're looking very sharp. Um, over to you. You are going to be talking about Lifter. 
you may not have your sound, Penny. So I don't, is that better? Better, okay, wasted loads of valuable time, right, I'm gonna gallop on. So we know when asking someone where they're from, it can come across from curiosity, but it can also serve to make people feel it, feel alienated because it can focus undue emphasis on their right to belonging. But asking somebody, tell me about yourself, what's your story, gives them an invitation to craft their response and weave their answer so it belongs anywhere and on its own terms. It's only when you look back or forwards or start to tell your own story that you can make sense of the links and connections that bring all of the elements together in that moment. And in preparation for today, I was thinking back to the many threads and moments that seem to have led me to here, to now and to this moment. Human stories have always fascinated me and they're what led me to study social anthropology at university. Social anthropology is basically the study of human stories from around the globe. After graduating, I wanted to explore beyond the pages of books and ended up buying a year's open ticket and accidentally spending 10 years abroad, learning, working, teaching, continuing weaving into my story, stories and histories with new threads of different hues that had echoes from my ancestors that I didn't know existed then. I learned new perspectives and new concepts every time I heard someone tell me their new story. And while I was away, I ended up learning a new language, Hebrew, which taught me words that don't just exist in English or that don't exist at all in English. And it opened up to me new cultural concepts that made me see the world in a different way. And one of my favourite words with no English equivalent is the word feel good, which describes genuine unselfish delight or pride in the accomplishment of another person. Another definition describes Filgun as a generosity of spirit, an unselfish, empathetic joy that someone, that something good has happened or might happen to another person. Like the South African concept of Ubuntu, I am because you are. Your success is our collective joy. And in the same way, your story is our collective story. And as part of my story, I've just spent two weeks in quarantine as each member of my household succumbed to the coronavirus one after the other. Suddenly, we needed to give each other a huge dose of feel good as one of us recovered meant the other one was going to fall ill in turn. The feeling of restriction of movement is even more acute being quarantined in the global pandemic when we're about to go into our second lockdown in six months. While telling my story, when telling our human story a year ago, did we imagine this incredible plot twist? And human stories are more important than ever. The world events of the past six months have brought this home to us in unique and often tragic ways. Like many occupying the education sector, I've been lucky to see the important importance of my work's potential with Lifter to harness the power of humanity for the common good. At Lifter, we capture human stories in the form of documentary films and turn these into 360 degree explorable immersive spaces where teachers and their students can learn about people, places, skills and values. While we're restricted from traveling and close human interaction, these human stories seem more precious than ever. And in the words of one student, Thomas, with Lifter's immersive platform, you're able to instantly teleport yourself halfway across the world while staying on the same spot and see how things are for real. One important aspect of schools offering for young people in their care is the element of broadening horizons and instilling a sense of cultural capital through text, music, art and experiences that are included in the curriculum, like school trips. We know that even in normal times, some children won't get the opportunity to go far beyond their own postcode and trips abroad are a luxury inaccessible for many. Teaching and learning through human stories using Lifter can be a useful and powerful way to ensure that students have experience of the world as part of their entitlement to cultural capital, especially at a time when trips, museum visits and getting out and about are so limited. 
This can be important also as a way to teach an understanding of the protected characteristics and show how equality and diversity are promoted within our schools. We've seen that teaching and learning through immersive human stories can bring depth, breadth and meaning to concepts for children, bringing these from the realm of information and into the realm of knowledge. Exploring Lifter's story worlds has enabled teachers to unlock critical thinking skills in their students, and teachers tell us they've seen students use rich vocabulary and oracy skills and understand con complex concepts that teachers weren't aware of previously. Engaging and learning through human stories can provide breadth. This breadth is important, and leading authority on learning, Chris Quigley, describes this breadth breadth as both cultural capital, i.e. the background knowledge of the world students need for inference and for understanding, and also the range of situations students need to grow confidence in threshold concepts. And these threshold concepts are understanding, um, are understood as concepts that open up new and previously inaccessible ways of thinking about something. Our vision at Lifter is to ensure that by the time a child completes their education, they will have visited every country in the world and they will have met at least one person in every place they go. So right now you can take your students all the way to an Ethiopian village to visit Mezgana and Gabeyu in their family home or hop over to Malte's garden in Berlin and see how honey is made or pop down to Cornwall to litter pick with Rob on the beach and so much more. We're excited that Lifter's platform and the immersive and engaging experiences help teachers and students find the language and medium to talk about concepts that are so vital and yet so hard to incorporate naturally into the curriculum, such as bias, difference, diversity, race, gender, sustainability, mental health, disability, resilience, skills and values. And we're delighted that our story has intersected with the global story of learning something learning being something that can take place both face to face or remotely, but that must continue no matter where we find ourselves. For many startups and edtech organisations, the pandemic has curtailed their trajectory, but we've been blessed with a surge of teachers being able to take advantage of our free training and access to the platform as our work has become ever more relevant to our human story right now. So if you're interested in finding out more about the free training and getting your hands on our new version of the platform, you can get in touch with me at penny at lifter.com. And while you're at it, tell me a bit about your story. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Wow, what what amazing input from all of you. Thank you so much. Um, very poetic um, close there, Penny. And I think the golden thread for me from all, all of your contributions is the idea of a diverse curriculum is about human storytelling. Um, and we've got some questions coming through from the audience. So Armadip, I'm going to come to you first. There's quite a lot of interest from some of the school teachers and school leaders about how they can build cultural competence into their insets, into their training and CPD offers. Could you speak um, to that? Yes, I am. There is a lot of background noise because I am in my gym, so I'm going to try and talk like this. Um, uh, so basically what we did was um, we did an insert on cultural competency based on the work of Dr. Laura Fontaine. So powerful. It talks about being aware of your own culture. Like I said, you know, the experiences we go through and actually a conversation I had very recently with my parents was, do we know our fourth generation ancestors and we don't and even my dad who stopped at two so I said it's really important to track back and find out and also then promote this within our staff and children Thanks for your tenacity with the background noise there, Armadi. We, we, I think we caught all of that. Don't stress, it's fine. Um, Chris, if I can come to you, because diversity, equity, inclusion is the, the lens of working in an international school is quite pertinent. Uh, and I'm working with quite a few international schools at the moment, particularly around how they're dealing with Black Lives Matters and racism. Um, and I just think what you said about the inclusivity of the curriculum and whose voices are being silenced, who is being seen, but how we identify those gaps. And it makes me think of your keynote, Benny, back at the Team English conference back in the summer. Like, Chris, how do you go about that as, like, with your team, with a department, with a school? How do you identify the gaps, perhaps? It's interesting that I think um, oh, we've all changed the um, handles. Um, who's, uh, is it Sufian? Excuse me if I've mispronounced it. Okay, Sufian was talking about the top-down um, 
curriculum design. So that's something that I, that I actually did before we we began our, our course this year was to go through all of our all of our units um, and provide additional resources, additional lesson plans that could be used. And and you know I think that's the, that's the point. It's also that could be used. And this is again not a box ticking. Not you must do this, that, and the other. But here are some other avenues to explore. So here's what the textbook that we're using. Um, here is how it covers this particular language point. Um, here are other resources that are other ways into this that you might want to use in your, in your classroom. So I think a little bit of top down as we were just, as we were talking about, but also then teachers making their own choices about what they want to use with the learners they've got. Um, otherwise, it becomes well. I think I think choice is important, uh, and, and and the autonomy then of the, of the teacher to uh, work with who is with them rather than again some idealized version of Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank that you, Chris. No, that's great. I'm sure, oh, okay. I'm sure ben, Penny, Benny will add a bit in a minute as well. I'm going to come to you next then, Sophia, and about okay. this kind of like how we move from the micro to the macro kind of like lens through the inclusive curriculum. And you spoke about contextual literacy. And could you just unpack for me a little bit further? Because I've heard lots of stories about um, schools around the country where perhaps they are visibly diverse, but they only have one culture, perhaps, as part of that school's diversity, and how, like you talked about having a high Pakistani um, population, how can we how can we look at diversity within diverse within, within diversity when, when we're thinking about our populations we're serving? I think it's re really important. I, I, we work with uh, Lifter for that for that very reason is the fact that actually uh, what you don't want to do is the only thing that you provide a school of Pakistani boys is Pakistani history or Pakistani uh, culture because actually yes we want to engage them but we also want them to be ready and prepared for the diverse world that we're in. We want them to understand diversity in all its forms. We want them to appreciate diversity in all its forms. Uh, within the culture and within the context again there will come some uh, biases that people might have picked up from a social settings and so on that need to also be broken and tackled. Uh, uh, within a school setting. So I think it's about that micro and macro, making sure that you're constantly aware of the bigger picture of inclusivity. And it's some of the work that we've done with you, Hannah, which was about the fact that actually, yes, there's a big space there for anti-racism curriculum, but there's also space there for an inclusive curriculum. And actually both can go hand in hand uh, because the anti-racism curriculum is a part of the macro bigger picture of an inclusive curriculum and what does inclusivity look like and the easy measure for us has been about looking at the protected characteristics as a point of reference to start with to see actually do they come to our school from year seven to year 11 by the end of their journey with us does the curriculum in its various forms in the various subjects allow us to tackle some of the issues that are surrounding those unprotected characteristics and not just one characteristic. So it's about, I think, using your one perhaps dominant characteristic as a way of really engaging your learners, talking about something that they will understand, empathize with, engage with very easily, but then to use that as a catalyst to go in to other areas and other protected characteristics, but using the same social skills that you've developed in one area to say, this is how it feels when you are a Pakistani boy and the prejudices that you face in a mainstream society. But what does that look like if you're disabled? What does it look like uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you're a female, if you're homosexual? What does it look like in the different spheres for that young person? Thank you, Sifian. Brilliant answer there. And I want to come to you next, um, Lila, about belonging. OK, so so we, we're thinking quite a lot here about the belonging of the children. But I'm interested in your reference to that um, Facebook group you created. And when we think about the belonging of the staff and communities of practice and the networks, could you just encourage some of the listeners in the audience about how they go about intentionally networking with people working in this space and how they can perhaps bring people together like you did with that Facebook group for ESOL? Okay, so first of all, the ESOL community 
is fantastic at supporting each other. There's a group called the ESOL Research Network that was created by James Simpson at Leeds University that's been going on for years. And they've always been a little bit more political. And you see it in a further education college. You can always tell who's an ESOL teacher because we're different. And we create our own resources compared to EFL and ELT. We don't use course book because what we do is tailored to the needs. People are talking about stretch and challenge differentiation. It is something that as a community in ESOL we're extremely familiar with. And um, so, yeah. So the question was about how do we actively seek and network? I think in this day and age, there are so many platforms what you're organizing today is a fantastic um, opportunity for people to learn, but also connect with each other. Um, so thank you, Hannah and Benny. Um, lo looking at virtual platform, the only issue is the time it takes, because at the moment I can be contacted in eight or nine different ways, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, and I'm sure, so, so, so it's about finding the balance, I guess, about which platform works for you. And then, I mean, you, you can tell me more, Hannah, because we both do similar things. And um, it's about maybe zooming in on something that would enable you to interact the best. So I think for you, it's Twitter. For some people, it might be LinkedIn. For other people, it might be Facebook. But given the fact that people are on so different platforms, if you want to be everywhere, you need to be LinkedIn everywhere. And that takes time. The last thing I want to say, because I'm very, very conscious of the time, is that it is very time consuming to design tailor-made resources. Publishers do not want to have this diversity represented in their course books because it doesn't pay. Internationally, LGBT is illegal in 80 countries around the world, punishable by death in 12. So it, it just, just employers needs to be mindful and make maybe the space and time to share knowledge, resources, so it's not just about the onus on the individual, but the onus on the school, like Chris did before half term, making all those thank resources you, Lila. available. And, and Penny, thank you for your poetic input, as always. Um, so many things I want to unpack there. I just, I just wanted to go back to this idea about how we can be curious of each other and and share our stories, but do it in an inclusive way rather than an othering way. Could you just share a little bit more about how that might work in a classroom situation, for example? So I think um, one of the good things about Lifters platform is it gives that kind of in because you can first of all focus on what you can see in front of you. And so we often start with children by just saying, where are you? How do you know? Um, and just look at what you're looking at. And, you know, anyone, adult or children will draw conclusions from what they see. They'll draw on their own bias and bias isn't always you know, negative, it's your kind of compass of how you anchor yourself and work out where you are. So I think through starting the conversation by trying to understand who you can see in front of you, um, you know, that's a, a really good way to do it. And I think it, it's quite a, it's quite, um, it's quite an art in a classroom situation or in a social situation to invite people to share stuff about themselves, but without spotlighting, you know, undue attention on things that people maybe hadn't realised about themselves or don't want to accentuate so it's got to be an invitation thank you penny and this question pop your hand up if you want to answer this question we've got a question from a teacher saying how do we teach diversity to children who are on the spectrum and perhaps that empathy's not there so who, who would like to who would like to start us off with with that answer about the inclusion go on lila do you want to jump in yes when i used to do lgbt inclusion in further education colleges the learning difficulties and disability department used to say to me, this is not relevant to us because people with learning difficulties and disabilities cannot be gay. Well, that's a myth to be debunked immediately. I'm talking from the adult perspective, number one. Number two, I'm not sure whether it's about empathy, but it's about awareness and visibility and just providing a range of example and a range of experiences. And in the same way that you would have like a tactile, a sensory or whatever experience that is needed for someone, it's about providing a range of experiences. 
Thank you, Lila. And I've got a question for you, Benny. I just wanted um, to pick up what Chris was saying about like, how do we bring the people who aren't heard and aren't seen into the curriculum? And I know you've got a book coming out soon. I want to spotlight your book. If you could speak about that, because you also just talk about the publishers, because I know you've been involved in a piece of work recently with publishers about diversifying textbooks. Yeah, so uh, the conversation has started and, and I, I have to say that, you know, more and more people are asking about, you know, well, how can we as an organisation, um, you know, do some justice to this work um, and so the intent is there but I recognise that what Lila is saying there are some severe restrictions about what can go into textbooks um, and what is published across the globe um, which is a sad state of affairs but it is the practical this is the realm that we live in um, for us I think you know we are we are the consumers of textbooks and so our feedback to the big companies you know your Pearsons um, your Collins is that you know our feedback matters um, and we've vote with our wallets and you know if we're not having a response that we we need and we're not seeing that positive representation well the, we do have some we have some agency there um so i would encourage you all to really think about how you can engage with those companies uh, to be able to have those conversations and that's you know contacting their um their content editors and saying actually have you thought about um and i find that most people are open to these um uh, conversations uh, so we can definitely make a difference that way and I wanted to pick up something that Penny said about social anthropology and in some ways you know and Penny is lucky enough to study it uh, at a very high level um, I'm not suggesting that all of us can do that but I do think that there is some merit in thinking of ourselves as educators, as, as social anthropologists of our children um, and understanding the stories that they come with. And I loved that idea. It's not where you're from. What's your story? Um, and I wish people would ask me that more often as a East African Asian woman who explains many, many times that we're fairly nomadic and this is our story so it's an incredible powerful experience a humbling experience to hear people's stories so thank you Penny for for sharing that that really resonated and I'm just going to speak to some of the audience um unfortunately at diversity equity and inclusion events we do sometimes pick up some trolls I don't think this is the space for you guys okay this is a positive conversation about diversity equity and inclusion um don't waste your time listening to us if you're not interested um so thank you very much to panel two absolutely amazing contributions it's really making me think about my own degree I did a BA honours in post-colonial literature and I think we quite often study books in translation um, and I think there's something there to think about as well about how voices are lost in translation when we when we translate books so go and get yourselves a cup of tea go have a toilet break thank you panel two and we'll be back for panel three shortly thank you